31st. Okay, so we're two weeks away from Halloween. It's 2020, the COVID-19 year. We're here at Duke Spine Institute getting ready to perform a Duke laser disc repair, which is endoscopic spine surgery at L45. Left approach. So, Doc, hi. So, we usually just, uh, I don't know if you looked at some of the other records from the other anesthesiologists, but I think it's mostly propofol at the right time. Um, I'll do a little bit of local to numb up the skin. And then when I start passing the dilator, which, you know, I'll sh tell you when. But then when I get down to the annulus of the disc, it's going to be uncomfortable. That's when we need the, the most uh, control. Um, and then the procedure should take about 15 minutes. You know, once I get started with the laser, 15, 20 minutes max. And then we'll be done. And it's pretty quick. The incision is tiny. It's like seven millimeters. I'm just talking to our anesthesiologist here, who she is, uh, I think, doing her first Duke laser disc repair today, so, but not her first surgery. <laughs> How many years have you been in practicing? A lot of years, so she's very experienced. All right, I'm just gonna walk over to the MRI and verify the level we're treating. Mm -hmm, scroll. Yep, L45 is definitely the worst. Keep going, the uh, scrolling the other way now. Keep going. Yep, keep going. All right, looks good. Okie doke. So our patient has a herniated disc at L45. And good morning. It's Dr. Duke Majin. We're going to get started. I'm just talking to uh, the people that are watching and explaining what we're doing. I'm going to give you some numbing medicine right here in your back. That's going to help make it more comfortable, but you're going to feel a little stick and burn right away, okay? It's going to last a few seconds. You're not going to like me for it. But, uh, yeah, we got to give you some numbing medicine. And then if you feel any discomfort during the surgery, I want you to say, ouch. Can you say that? Yep. But don't try to get off the table and don't try to move, all right? It's real important that you just say, ouch, and let me give you more numbing medicine to make you more comfortable, all right? Which may s mostly will be you giving a little more propofol probably. Um, are you comfortable where you are? All right, we're gonna get started and then we're gonna put you to sleep in about, probably about 10 minutes from now, you'll go to sleep, okay? And when you wake up, we'll be done. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give you some numbing medicine. Remember, if you feel pain, you say, ouch, but don't try to move your body off the table. That's my fingers just pinching your back. We're on the left side. Everybody agrees? Okay, yep. Little stick and burn. That's just the numbing medicine going in. It's totally normal. I apologize. I wish there was another way to do this that was more comfortable. Four cc's injected. Watch the needle. All right. Now I'm going to be talking to my team and I'm going to be talking to our viewers, okay? And sometimes I'll talk to you as well, sir, all right? Shot. All right, let's go lateral. So we're going to use an x ray machine to look at the spine. This table's a little too close to me. And the x-ray machine will help guide us to the right place in the spine, okay? And the right place in the spine would basically be the L45 disc. Now, if you look at the picture there, very nice job on the x-ray so far. Yeah, you can bring the collimator in so that we have a smaller field. It's not a problem. All right. Um, we're going to basically navigate right to where the L45 disc is. I have to assess my entry point. I have to assess my trajectory and make sure that they're both proper. Okay. So before I can do that on an x-ray, I have to make sure that the x-ray machine is lined up with the spine perfectly. And right now it's not. I think we can get the end plate of L4, the inferior end plate lined up a little better. 
And to do that, we're going to have to wag. In this case, we're going to wag the uh, floral arm. Just go ahead and move it and take a picture. I don't want to stop talking to, to tell you. That's perfect right there. You agree? You see it's better, right? All right. So if you look at the x-ray picture, folks, and I don't know if Sean is projecting it, but you see on the left side of the spine, there's a, a skinny little um, grayish colored thing. That's a needle. And uh, that's, that's like almost a perfect trajectory to where I need to go. We're aiming for the L45 disc. Our patient actually on the MRI has problems with L3, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 1, but today we're only addressing one disc. And this is the one I believe that's causing the vast majority of his symptoms, if not all of them. Are you comfortable? Shot. So the tip of the needle is at the facet joint at this point. Yeah, I understand, Shot. We're almost done. I apologize. Are you comfortable, Shot? That's like the perfect trajectory right there. Are you comfortable, Shot? Sir? All right, so, Shot? It, they say it's better to be lucky than good, right? So I got, I got a little of both. We got it on the first try. And for those aspiring surgeons that are watching this video long after I'm dead and gone, because there's nobody else in the world that does this procedure, so I have to memorialize it so that hopefully someday someone will come along and take an interest in the surgery that truly is the best spine surgery in the world for herniated discs. And they'll figure it out and then they're gonna wanna know how I did it and why I did things I did. So the patient's awake so we can make sure that we're not hitting the nerve root. If I hit the nerve root, he would say, ouch, there's pain going down my leg, there's electricity going down my leg, there's bad feeling in my leg, okay? He didn't have any of that. So I know that I went past the nerve root perfectly and uh, we're ready now to do our discogram. Now this patient is suffering mostly with back pain, chronic back pain in the lower back around the belt line. And this is the kind of pain folks that most doctors will tell you is in your head. There's nothing that can be done to fix it. Just live with it. And honestly, 98% of people that have this pain, the way they deal with it is they'll just modify their lifestyle. So instead of like skiing or playing sports that they love to do, they'll just take it easy because those kind of activities bring on the back pain and they'll pay for it for days afterwards. So what, what I tell everyone is you don't have to live and change your lifestyle living with this back pain, changing what you do, avoiding the things you like to do, avoiding playing football with your grandkids or baseball or going to to be active, you don't have to live that kind of a lifestyle. You can fix your pain, get rid of it, let the disc heal, which takes about a year to heal fully, and then you can go back to doing whatever you want to do. And that's the way we, that's our treatment philosophy at Duke Spine Institute. It's not modify your lifestyle to accommodate your pain and avoid pain, it is fix your problem so you can go and do whatever you want in life. And that's, that's what we recommend, that's what we promote is that lifestyle of, of getting out of pain so that you can do what you want. All right, sir. Uh, at this point, I'm going to do the discogram. I'm sure you've seen many of these before. It's an evocative discogram. We're going to evoke a response most likely. We don't know for sure, but if I'm right about picking the right disc, then it will evoke a response. And then after that, we're going to put them to sleep. So what I'll typically do is ask my patients to count from one to 100 out loud while you put them to sleep. And we know they're asleep when they stop counting. It's pretty obvious. So, um, all right. Are you comfortable, sir? Yes. All right. Where do you feel that? Where do you feel that? Huh? In your back? How bad is it on a scale of one to 10? All right, a 10. Is that where you typically get your back pain? See how simple it is, folks? I just did a, a test. I didn't tell him when I was gonna do it. And I injected a little bit of dye into his disc. And what do you know? Horrible pain. 
So we pressurized his disc. It's called an evocative discogram. He had 10 out of 10 pain. It was concordant. All right, we're going to put you to sleep. When you wake up, your surgery will be done. I'd like you to count from 1 to 100 out loud. Can you do that? Out loud. Nice and loud. All right. So on the lateral view, I've got my guide wire in. I'm taking my spinal needle out. And you're doing great. Everything's fine. We found the bad disc, and we're going to fix it. That pain will be gone the rest of your life when you wake up. All right, we're going to make a 7 millimeter. The entire surgery is done through a 7 millimeter incision. Now, people say, is this percutaneous? The answer is no. This is not percutaneous. A percutaneous procedure is done with a needle. We're past the needle. We don't do surgery through needles, okay? There's not, there's not any real surgery you can do to fix people with a needle. You can inject things with a needle, but you can't fix people's disc with a needle. You actually have to do surgery on the disc. Are you awake? Nice. All right, so there it is. We're right on the back of the disc with the dilator. And by the way, there's a huge tear back there in the back of the disc. Okay, so now we're going to enter the disc, and that's the L45 disc. So we're going to enter the disc, and guess where we're entering it, folks? You'll be happy to know we're entering it right where the herniation is. So are we creating more damage to the disc? I think it was your phone maybe lighting up. We're actually not creating any more damage. Cam, why? No problem. Cam wasn't paying attention. But I like the honesty. I appreciate honesty. Shot. So, Luis, why are we going, why are we not causing any damage to the disc? Because we're going... Yeah, we're going right where the damage is. So we're not creating any new damage. We're going where the damage and the herniation already are. So that's one of the advantages of this technique. Are you pulsing? Yes. All right. Okay, good. So for those of you wondering what those squiggly lines are, that's just the uh, um, marker that's found inside the, the sponge that we use. So we surgeons don't leave sponges in people. Now, obviously, we're not going to leave a sponge in anybody. So we've passed through the foramen, and we've gone right through the herniation and the annular tear. So we're not causing any additional damage to the spine. Every other spine surgery out there, folks, microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, artificial disc, every single spine surgery in the world, except for this one, damages the spine to get to the herniated disc and fix it. Okay? This is the only surgery that doesn't. This is one of the reasons we do this surgery. We don't want to add more damage to patient's spine. It creates instability. And when you get instability, you'll need a fusion to fix it. So we're actually going through a tear that's already there. Shot? We're in. And now we're going to get the dilator out. Shot? All right, great. You can come out with the floral. So folks, take a look here, Sean. Show everybody what we're doing. Well, why is he moving? I think he's a little bit light. We can see. All right. The entire surgery, folks, is being done through this little tube. My little, I call it the McDonald's shake straw. Lay still. You're fine. Everything's okay. Cam, get on this side. Put your waist there. You don't want the patient coming up. All right. In the meantime, we'll keep moving. So the Duke laser disc repair is endoscopic surgery done with a single incision and a single tube. And the tube is 7 millimeters outer diameter. The incision in the skin is 7 millimeters. That's half of the width of a dime, folks. Any questions, Sean, from our audience? None so far. All right. So today we're doing a single level. This is always at the bottom. The scope should never be on until I'm ready for it to be on. Who turned it on? Uh, wasn't it yeah. Not a problem. Let's just not do that. 
Okay, Cam, this is going to go here because you want the blue towel to grab the water and drip it right into this. Okay? All right, now you want all those cables coming around here. Otherwise, they'll be pulling on this thing the whole time. Okay? Good. All right, ready for the scope to come on? Well, right, let's show the audience what we're doing here real quick. Turn the light back on. Sean, can you see? Yes, we can. So you see the little tube we're going to work through. There's not many things the surgeon can use down through that tube. As a matter of fact, there's only two instruments that can be used. Maybe a third, but we're not going to talk about the third one because we don't use it. It's a drill, a drill bit. So we're going to use an endoscope, which is a long shaft metal tube that has the ability to take images or pictures and transmit them up the shaft to a camera, which is what I hold in my hand. We have a light source, we have irrigation, which is fluid. And then of course we have a little working channel where we're gonna put our instruments. All right, let's get started. So we're inside the disc, you see the blue there folks? That blue is, is the nucleus propulsus. That is the uh, part of the herniation. As a matter of fact, last week, was it last week we got a really good herniation out? We had, we had a doctor that's a herniation. Let's show them. Turn the light on. Can you see that, Sean? The herniation right there? Yes, we can. So I grabbed it out with a grabber. You see that, folks? It's a grabber. It's an endoscopic grabber. It's designed specifically for this endoscope. Out, out of Germany. The Germans make really high-quality surgical instruments, some of the best in the world and they designed these stuff. That's where I bought it. It's all FDA approved. People ask me, is this FDA approved 100%? If you do surgery in the United States with anything that isn't FDA approved, it's illegal. Basically, you go to Club Fed. So everything we do at Duke Spine Institute is 100% legal, approved, FDA approved, vetted, appropriate, safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have a question. Yes. One of our viewers is wondering, isn't it unsafe for the patient to be able to move while you're in their back? Is it unsafe for the patient to be able to move when, while I'm in their back? Yes. If the patient was wiggling around all over the place, it would be very unsafe. But that's why we use anesthesia, to put the patient to sleep. So our patient is actually asleep right now. And I have an anesthesiologist who's at the head of the bed, who's monitoring the patient's blood pressure, vitals, and making sure they're getting enough oxygenation, okay? So the patient is asleep and they're not moving. Now sometimes they'll start moving a little bit, but we can see those little movements, we can identify them, and then we can treat the patient with some more sedative. That's how normal anesthesia is done for any surgery, not just the Duke laser disc repair. Good question. All right, so the blue thing is the laser fiber. I need you to wipe the laser. Grab it and wipe it. Yep. Yeah, so Luis is right. Luis is very observant that um, you can predict what I'm going to do based on that monitor. Once you learn my steps, you'll see that I do the same thing over and over again. Okay? Surgeons are creatures of habit. Good surgeons are creatures of habit. And the reason I say that is they develop a process for a specific treatment, a specific type of surgery, they develop a set of steps, and it literally can be hundreds of steps, that they f do every single time. And those are good surgeons. There's a lot of bad surgeons out there who don't have those processes in place. And then it's like, you know, taking a boat out into a storm. Every time you operate, you never know what's gonna happen. You may even sink. That's not good. <laughs> So, you know, think about it. If you want to ship something from Portugal to Africa, you have to take your ship out in the ocean. And if you're the one who's hiring a captain of a boat to ship your product from one place to another, you want to know that you've picked a captain of a boat who's smart, who's intelligent, who's experienced, who has the right materials, equipment, in staff, which would be the sailors working on the boat, that they're gonna get the job done every time properly without you losing your product 
out in the ocean, right? So you can think of a surgeon like a ship's captain. And if the captain is a great captain and has a great record, they're not going to lose anything out in the ocean. Why? Because they study the weather patterns. They understand the, the ocean, how it works. They know when the storms are going to come. They know when the weather is going to change. And they sail appropriately. And if the weather does suddenly change unexpectedly, then they see what's happening is this is, look, look, come here, look at this. This is collapsing here, and then this is dripping over it. You see that? We can't have that. This has to be into the bag. So you have to watch that. I'm going to be pushing up against this, but you got to make sure that blue towel is going in there. Otherwise, it goes on my shoe. So a good captain will, will be the one that gets their cargo to its destination each and every time. And that's the captain you want to hire to do your job. And the captains are a lot like surgeons, okay? The captain by themselves cannot sail the ship. They must have staff, a crew. And a surgeon by themselves cannot uh, do a surgery by themselves. It's impossible unless you're cutting off a piece of skin or like a zit or a sebaceous cyst, you know. But to do complicated spine surgery like this, you must have, you know, at least I have eight people basically helping me take care of this patient and doing the surgery right. And I don't have a single person more than I need to do the job. So I have to have the right eight people that do the job properly. And the captain of the ship is always going to make sure that they have the right eight people, you know, that do the job the right way. So, you know, before we even set sail, I have to make sure I have the right people here helping me and that they're going to do their jobs properly. Because if anybody screws up their job, the whole mission is uh, at risk of failure. Okay? So just since nobody's asking questions, I'll just keep talking. Um, so the captain needs to have the experience to know what to do when, but also they need the right ship, the right equipment basically, and they need the right crew, which is the right staff. The reason I'm talking about ships and cargo is because I just got back from Portugal last night at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we were there practicing for the world championship in go-karting. As most of you know who have been following me for years, my son, Arias Duke Majin, is the number one driver in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, North America, and the number one ranked driver. And he's representing the United States in the World Championship. And so the track, is, the racetrack is in Portugal. It's in a place called Portimao. It's the same place as the w Formula One World Championship this year, but not the same track because that's a big track for cars. We're on the go-kart track next to that. As a matter of fact, I was staring at the racetrack for Formula One, the race which will be, uh, I think, in a week. Uh, I was staring at that track all day long while I was watching Arias racing on the go-karting track in Portimao, Portugal. Everybody seems to think I had fun there, but we just did 25 hours of traveling yesterday. We literally left Portimao and 25 hours later arrived back home here in Florida. 25 hours straight of traveling is exhausting, as you can imagine. It's not fun. And then when we go there, we're on the track all day. We're there from 8.30 in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. You don't get to go out and do anything. And uh, basically, you're eating racetrack food, which is not the best kind of food. point is, is it's, it's hard work, but uh, the truth is, is, if we didn't go, laser off, if we didn't go, uh, Arius would have no chance at all of, of even making the final race, which is the 40 of the best drivers that do well for the, uh, what are called the qualifying heats, and you have no chance of making it in the qualifying heats if you don't qualify well. So you have to be fast and you have to be able to drive well, both. The problem is that the engine they use in Europe for these races is not the same engine used in the United States. Since there's no questions, I'll just keep talking. The engine used in Europe is uh, 
it's an engine where the crankshaft is directly attached to the rear axle. Whereas in the United States, we have our engines are, are, are used with a clutch system where the crankshaft and the axle do not directly connect. They connect through a clutch. So when you're driving the clutch engines, it's very, very, very different than driving the direct drive engines, which have no clutch. Because all your braking is transmitted directly to the crankshaft when you hit the brakes. So to learn, for Arius to have to learn a new engine with a different braking strategy and a different throttle response is almost impossible to be able to do that. It really is. And be able to be competitive with the European drivers that have been using that engine package for um, 10 years because that's all they race in Europe is that engine package. So Arius has to learn an entirely new engine package and a braking system that's completely different than what he does in the United States. And driving is all about braking and throttle response and steering inputs, that's it. It's all about those three things and they're, they're completely different in Europe for this uh, world championship race. And the drivers there are phenomenally good because they literally live on the racetrack every day. Unfortunately, we don't. Arius is a student in high school so he doesn't live on the racetrack. Many of the drivers there are homeschooled, whereas Arius actually goes to school. Standby laser, wipe. You gotta grab the whole cable. This is not a little thing, yeah, there you go. Any questions? We do have one. All right. One of our viewers is wondering, is this A little this bit louder, Sean, I'm sorry. Just a little bit. It's okay. Uh, one of our viewers is wondering, is this the same surgery that you do in the neck or how is it different? Yeah, great question. So is this the same surgery we do in the neck? The answer is yes. It doesn't matter whether the disc herniation is in the neck, the lower back or the thoracic. The concept is the same. It is debridement of the annular tear, removal of the herniation and opening of the space around the nerves. So those are the three goals of this Duke laser disc repair. What's different though is the approach. And what's meant by the approach is how the surgeon gets to the part of the body they need to fix, okay? So the approach for the lower back is through the back, you know? The patient is laying on their belly. Great job, by the way. The patient's laying on their belly and uh, we're going through their back. Now, what's different for our approach for the Duke laser disc repair compared to say a microdiscectomy or a laminectomy, all of those laminectomy microdiscectomy surgeries are done in the middle of the back. The surgeon makes a cut in the middle, but we're way off to the side, 45 degrees out. And that's because we're not going through the spine itself, we're going around the spine through a hole that's already there. That's one of the advantages of the surgery is to actually go through a natural opening in the spine so that we don't have to damage the spine to get to the herniation like everybody else does, all the other surgeons do. They have to damage your spine. Now they don't tell you about that because it's standard, right? It's kind of like when you join the military, all right, to fight as a soldier, they don't talk much about you're gonna die. Many of you are gonna die. You're gonna get a bullet wound to your chest, to your heart, to your head, and you're gonna bleed to death and have massive trauma to your brain. They don't talk to you about that because that's just part of the job and they expect everybody to kind of know that. They focus on training you to maybe avoid those types of injuries, but when it comes to microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, artificial disc, spine surgeries, there's no way to avoid the damage that's gonna happen from the surgery itself. You understand what I'm saying? Well, with the Duke laser disc repair, we avoid all that collateral damage that normally happens with other spine surgeries because we go through a hole that's already there. So we're not having to create new holes in the spine. Whereas microdiscectomy, laminectomy, they're creating new holes in your spine. And those holes are bad. They're gonna create more problems for the patient down the road. But they don't tell the patient about it because that's what everybody else does. And it's like just known to be part of the treatment. But once I learned this technique and I learned how different it was, I realized this was a much better way to fix people's herniated discs by going around the side. But it requires very special training. 
that's not taught to spine surgeons in the United States and most of the rest of the world. And it requires using instruments and equipment like the endoscope, which spine surgeons are not trained to use, at least not in this application. So I had to have special training and special equipment and I have staff that are specially trained as well to do the surgery. So to fully answer the question, there's, you know, the cervical spine approach for the neck is through the front. For the lumbar spine or lower back, it's through the back. So we're approaching through opposite sides of the body, neck versus back. But the, the concept of what I'm doing once I'm inside the herniation which is what I'm doing right now with the laser. I'm cleaning all this stuff up. That's the annular tear I'm cleaning up. And that blue stuff is the herniation. It's part of the herniation that's still there. We've already removed a lot of it, but that's what's still there. This is the annular tear right here that I'm cleaning up with the laser. And by cleaning up the annular tear, what I'm doing is I'm gonna allow the disc to heal properly, okay? So when somebody gets a herniated disc in their neck or back or thoracic, Many people will heal those discs on their own without surgery. The pain will go away and they'll be able to be normal and do normal things. But m a lot of people can't heal the, the tear because this, this stuff I'm zapping right here, this blue stuff, this stuff just gets in the way of the tear healing. And you see all the white uh, at the tip of the laser? That's scar tissue and calcium. That's calcium deposits in the disc from injury to the tissue of the disc from a long time ago. This has been long standing. And so what you're seeing is calcium deposits that are not normally there. They're there only because of chronic inflammation inside this part of the disc tear. So we're almost done. I need about five minutes. See the tear right there? Right there. So we've got to clean up the edges of the tear. That's called the annular debridement. And stuck in between those edges is pieces of herniated disc. So whether you do this in the lumbar, the thoracic, or the cervical, it's the same idea. It's just a different approach to the disc. You can't get to the cervical disc herniation through the back of the neck. You would basically paralyze the patient if you tried. And that's not acceptable. That's not an acceptable outcome. Our patients that have had this laser surgery now for 14 years, I've been doing it. I've done over 1,200 surgeries. That's 1,200 surgeries in 14 years. Not a single complication, not a single complication. No infection, no nerve damage, no spinal fluid leaks. The only thing is that 1% of the patients, one in 100, will have another herniation in the same spot that I just fixed. And that's usually almost always because they did something they weren't supposed to do. About 80% of the time. 20% of the time, they're sleeping at night, they wake up in the morning, and they have a, a re-herniation. Um, I still think a lot of those times they were doing something in bed, tossing and turning maybe, really violently or aggressively that caused the disc to re-injure. But there's no doubt about it, there, there is re-herniations that happen and it's about 1% of the time. Which is a really good re-herniation rate by the way. When you compare it to microdiscectomy, it's usually, when microdiscectomy, symptomatic disc re-herniations are usually around 10% to 20% depends on the surgeon that does it. So this is a 1%. So it's a much better re-herniation risk rate with the Duke laser disc repair. And that's because we're not removing the bones in the back of the spine and the lumbar spine to get to the herniated disc. Like the other surgeons do with microdiscectomy, they have to remove bone and ligaments, which destabilizes the spine even more. So hopefully I answered your question. Ken, were you paying attention that time? I was. All right, good. There's, there's hope for you yet. We have another question. Yes, I'll take the question. One of our viewers is wondering, once you remove the herniation with the laser, do you have to replace it with something else to stabilize the spine? Yeah, great question. Once I remove, the question was, once I remove the herniation with the laser, which is what we're doing right now, do I have to replace it with something else to stabilize the spine? The answer is no, and here's why. The herniation we're taking out is a piece of the jelly that was normally found between the, between the bones, called vertebrae, okay? But it's, it, a tear has happened in the annulus and that jelly is squeezed out through the tear. 
So a lot of people are thinking, all right, well, once you take the herniation out, is, don't you have to replace it? No, because the herniation is actually not part of the disc anymore. Once it squeezes out through the tear, it's out of place. And that jelly is already lost from the center of the disc. It's gone. And it will never go back in there. So by removing the herniation, we're taking a piece of the jelly that was in the center of the disc that now squeezed out through a tear in the annulus. So it's actually out of position. It would be like taking a toothpaste b uh, bottle and squeezing the toothpaste out through the opening and then trying to get the toothpaste back into the toothpaste jar. You don't need to do that because the piece that I'm taking out is already damaged, it's bad. It should not be put back in the disc. It will only come back out again later on at a later date. That would be a reherniation. So you don't want to do that. No, what happens is the disc heals just fine without that jelly that used to be there. And we're not taking any additional jelly out of the disc. We're only taking the herniation piece that's already squeezed out and removing it. Think about it this way. I'm, and I don't want to make, I don't want you to make the wrong analogy here, but if somebody has a tumor growing on their body and you take the tumor out, do you have to put cells back? No. The tumor itself is not normal. Those are not normal cells. And they're not in a position where they're supposed to be. They're not functioning properly. So the herniation is the same way as a tumor. And as a matter of fact, it is a tumor. It's just not a cancerous tumor. So it's a, it's a mass of tissue that is it, not in the right place, okay? But not because of growth, but because of translocation. You can think about it that way. All right, just about done. I got five minutes left, Max. I'm just cleaning up the lateral tear. You can see the annulus here. It's just clumpy and scarred. Got to get rid of that stuff because it's bad. If you're a surgeon watching the surgery, you know what a debridement is. Basically, I'm doing an annular debridement. And we're the first place in the world to ever publish or describe an annular debridement of the disc. Nobody else in the world has ever done that. No one else does it. This is the first and only surgery that does it. And that's why we're able to get rid of back pain and neck pain and thoracic pain, because of the debridement. The debridement is something that I discovered being valuable many years ago to curing pain and I published it. It's in uh, Surgical Neurology International, Duke Laser Disc Repair. It's one of the three steps that have to be taken to successfully treat a herniated disc and get rid of pain. All right, we should be very close to the end. We are starting to see some of the fibers of the posterior longitudinal ligament, a little bit of epidural fat up there at 12 o'clock. And this is the last part of that tear. Now we knew there was a tear because number one, there's a herniated disc and all disc herniations must have a tear. This is the tear right here, the outer part of the tear. This is gonna be the most painful part of this disc injury is right out here. This is where all the nerve fibers are gonna be. That's a blood vessel right there. It's called a vein at 12 o'clock. Yes, Sean, you have another question? Yes, we do. One of our viewers is wondering, I have three completely degenerated discs in my neck. What would I be able to do to make the pain go away? Three completely degenerated discs in my neck. What could I do to make the pain go away? That was the question. The answer is you could do this surgery right now that you're watching. This would be the best treatment in the world for you. Duke Laser Disc Repair repairs degenerated discs and gets rid of the pain from degenerated disc because it's actually the annular tear in the degenerated disc that causes the pain. And that's what we fix with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. The other option would be a spinal fusion. If I were you, whoever asked that question, or if anybody out there wants to know what can be done to fix my pain, take your MRI scan and upload it on Duke Spine Institute's website. Duke Spine Institute's website. Sean will post you the link. If you upload your MRI, we will review it for free, no charge to you, and we'll tell you exactly what we think you should do to fix the problem. 
Our patients that we operate on get 95% elimination of their chronic back pain on average, 95% on average. And when we look at these same patients five years later, six years later, they still have 95% elimination of their back pain. I need two minutes. So it's durable, that means it lasts. You, there's no other surgery in the world that gives you 95% on average elimination of back pain five years after their surgery. There's no other surgery. So this is a very special treatment, which is why we broadcast these surgeries so people can learn about the latest and best treatments for spine problems that are available in the world. This treatment is available here in Florida in the United States. You won't find it anywhere else in the world. There's endoscopic spine surgery wipe else in the world. Come on, man. quickly, quickly. We're trying to balance the, you, you can't just wipe half of it. it. It is a grab and a wipe, okay? Not just to run your cotton, your thing on the top of it. That's not wiping. So I get the question often, how long does the surgery last? It lasts a lifetime. If you're 30 years old and you're gonna live another 50 years, it'll last 50 years. As long as you don't re-injure the disc. And that usually means don't lift something very heavy after surgery before the disc is healed, okay? It literally takes a year to fully heal these discs, one year. So I ask people to Restrict their lifting to about 40 pounds for the first year. And after a year, they can go back to doing normal stuff. The problem is when people start doing things too early because they don't want to follow the instructions, that's when they end up with a herniated disc. All right, 30 seconds, I apologize. It's taking me a little bit longer. Any more questions from our audience, Sean? No, we're done. None others. Laser off. All right, let me show you the nerve root. Well, it's covered by fat. So that's the foramen. So you couldn't really see it because he has a lot of fat around it, which is normal, by the way. Everyone normally has fat around their nerve root. Unless the compression or stenosis narrowing has been long-standing where's my rolled piece of blue towel watch it with the needles up there please good job everyone so let's show you guys we're gonna take the tube out I'm gonna apply a little bit of pressure because I don't want the muscles bleeding or getting some intramuscular clot that will cause pain for a week or two afterwards so if you just put about 10 millimeters of mercury pressure which is not much I'm putting about 30 or 40 right now you can keep the veins from bleeding. All right, Cam, you ready? Yep, okay, why don't you put the scope up there first? So look, okay, you want to close this, which you did. Very good. You want to unscrew that. Nice. We don't want the scope dropping. It's the other way. If the scope drops, it's $12,000 gone. Hold pressure. Let's show our audience. So you want about that much pressure right there for a few minutes. Let me show the audience. Sean, can you see? Yes, we can. All right, let's show them the incision. The whole surgery was done with a little cut right there. You all see that? Seven millimeters. 
Here's the middle of the back. Here's the butt. The head is up this way. Normally surgeons cut you here to fix your spine. We go through the side. Go ahead, put it back on. Thanks everyone, good job. This patient will go home in about 30 minutes. No hospital stay, no being at the hospital, risking an infection in your back, blood clots in your legs, pneumonia, all those bad things that happen in hospitals. All this is done outpatient. And like I said, 14 years, 1,200 surgeries, not a single complication to date. I'm gonna call our EBL 2 mil. Okay, let's see, DL, DR. Any questions? If you have questions, please write them up right now and I will be happy to answer them for you, okay? Any questions, write them up. I'll be happy to answer them for you. I'm gonna come over to the conference room and sit down with Sean and we'll chat for a little bit. Nice work, everybody. Thanks for your help. Well, Doc, I'm sorry we didn't have the other case, but they couldn't get the authorization from United Healthcare, so we should have that probably in a few more days, maybe by next week. Nice to meet you. Okay, Dr. Duke Majin, as we said, October 15, 2020, and we just finished the Duke Laser Disc Repair Lumbar for chronic back pain. And what does this surgery cure? It cures back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain, and then radicular symptoms. What are radicular symptoms? Well, a lot of people with back pain from a disc problem end up having leg symptoms. What does that mean? Well, they get numbness in their leg, weakness in their leg, tingling, and of course pain going down their leg. Now, do you have to have all four of those? No, a lot of people have one or two or sometimes three. Rarely do people have all four symptoms. But radicular symptoms means leg or arm symptoms as a result of 
um, the nerve root having a problem. And the nerve root comes out through a hole behind the, the disc, right where the herniations are. So disc herniations are the most common cause of nerve root problems. And that's why over the last 100 years, spine surgeons have come to treat patients for nerve root problems due to herniated discs. But here's the problem. Here's the disconnect. Here's the pearl. Here's the essence. Spine surgeons universally believe that nerve root problems caused by a herniated disc must come from a large disc herniation, large. And that is where they fail, where that is where they're wrong. Nerve root symptoms come from disc herniations, but they can come from very small herniations. As a matter of fact, 90% of the time that people have nerve root symptoms, it's from a small herniation that they, the surgeon doesn't recognize as being big, compressing the nerve root. And here's why. The reason is simple, and it's something that I learned many years ago through all my travels around the world, learning as much as I can about herniated discs and how they cause symptoms. Herniated disc most commonly cause symptoms not by pushing on the nerve root, but by irritating the nerve root through a process called inflammation. So why does that inflammation occur? This is what I discovered at Duke Spine Institute. This is what I've published in my publications for the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Nerve roots get irritated from inflammation because of the annular tear. It is the annular tear that's responsible for the inflammation in the annular tear and leaking out onto the nerve root behind the annular tear. Therefore, the inflammation causes back pain or neck pain by irritating the annular tear nerves, and then it causes arm or leg pain or symptoms of ridiculous symptoms like numbness, tingling, weakness by irritating the nerve root running behind the annular tear. So it's two completely separate issues. Back pain, neck pain come from the annular tear. Arm or leg symptoms come from inflammation of the nerve root, the covering over the nerve root. This is my contribution, Dr. Duke Majin, Dr. R. Duke Majin's contribution to the curing and restoration of normal spine health to the world. And it's probably literally not tooting my own horn, but it's the most significant finding relative to herniated discs and disease that we've discovered in many, many years, probably the last 50 years. Why is it so significant? Because the dogma of today is wrong. The dogma of today says that a herniation has to be big and it has to be squashing the nerve to cause the symptoms that need surgery and treatment. What I'm teaching everyone, which is completely different against the dogma, is that small herniations and annular tears can cause back and leg symptoms and that the back and leg symptoms can be cured when you fix the annular tear and get rid of the source of inflammation. And that is revolutionary, folks. That is completely different than what everyone else understands and believes. And that's something I discovered 15 years ago when I started doing the surgery because I was able to cure people's, not just their leg symptoms, but their back pain. And when I started thinking about it, because herniated disc surgery, microdiscectomies don't cure back pain. Okay, because surgeons do microdiscectomies for squashing of the nerve, and it's not the squashing of the nerve root that causes back pain or neck pain. It is the annular tear. So it has nothing to do with unsquashing the nerve. You can successfully unsquash a nerve, and you're still going to have a patient with back pain or neck pain because you didn't treat the annular tear. <laughs> and that is why spine surgeons today, according to the dogma, will not do spine surgery on a herniated disc to fix back pain or neck pain. They only do it to fix leg weakness or arm weakness from a squashing of a nerve. But we're under treating the country. We are under treating all the patients out there suffering with chronic back pain and chronic neck pain because we're not recognizing the fact that a herniated disc with annular tear creates inflammation and that inflammation gets on the nerve root and causes leg and arm symptoms that are very debilitating for people and very easy to fix with the Duke laser disc repair surgery. That's what I'm broadcasting these surgeries for people to learn that and understand it because the doctors aren't ever going to in the next 20, 30 years aren't going to change the dogma. Okay, it's impossible. 
right? And I'm going to tell you it's impossible. I've tried. I've gone to meetings. I've published papers. I've presented papers at the most esteemed and prestigious meetings of neurosurgeons, uh, orthopedic surgeons at NAS, at American Association of Neurological Surgeons, at Congress of Neurological Surgeons, at all the Becker's spine meeting, at all these big meetings that surgeons go to. They've heard my presentation. They've seen the data. They've seen the evidence, and yet they don't want to change what they do. Okay? Now, is it unique to Duke Laser Disc Repair, this behavioral pattern? No. The same thing happens with artificial discs. When artificial discs first hit the United States, this was back in like 97, 98, um, you know, about 20 years ago in the United States, there were a few surgeons that adopted this artificial disc technology, but the vast majority of the surgeons did not. And the reason is they were just doing fusions. And it's really, really hard to get people to change their behavior and their patterns of behavior. So why did I change? I changed because I saw the results of the Duke Laser Disc Repair Surgery, curing back pain, curing neck pain, curing thoracic pain that people had lived with for years and that nothing else worked to fix. And so I became a believer in this technology because it actually works. And then I started to understand the physiology behind it and why it works. And I've, and I've now published on that, and I understand it, and we're trying to get that out. So if somebody out there wants to be cured of their pain in their back, their neck, their thoracic, and down their arm or leg, the right procedure is the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Do we have any questions, Sean? All right, well, I hope you enjoyed the surgery, and we'll have some more surgeries for you next week. Otherwise, Sean and I are signing out from Duke Spine Institute.